Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Jan Hatcher Roberts. Nabila Khaled. Hi there, David Zak is here. Ivy Abernethy is here already. <laughs> Hi there, Krishna here. Hi there, this is Hebert Sukting. And Don Poland. Hello, David. Hi, Blake Poland here. Hi, so I'd like to uh, welcome everyone um, and good afternoon, good morning to the people here on the West Coast. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar and thank you all for joining today. Um, I think we're just going to wait a couple minutes to let pe more people join in and then we can get started. Hello, Laurel. I see that you're on. You can ignore my email. Hi there. Uh, that was Dawn sending you the message. Hi, Emily. Emily, you're muted. Thanks, Don. Uh, so my name is Emily. I'm the coordinator of the Students Young Professionals Network. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we're really pleased to bring you this um, really relevant webinar. Um, and it's been put on today in conjunction with the SIPs from the British Columbia uh, Coalition Institute Community of Practice, as well as the Coalition's Cli um, Climate Change Working Group. Um, I'll introduce our moderator for today and then I'll pass, pass it over. Um, so our moderator today is Krishna Todi. Krishna is a master's candidate, candidate in public health with a concentration in global health and is also the BCCI SIP representative for Simon Fraser University. Um, so over to you, Krishna. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, so I hope everyone's doing good and is all safe and healthy during such trying times that the world is facing today, first and foremost. Um, so before we get started, there are some housekeeping notes that I want to mention. Uh, the webinar platform uses teleconference for audio as you're given the dialing details already. Uh, so please make sure that your microphones are muted unless you're speaking which will happen towards the discussion session. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them in the chat box, um, the button for which you'll find at the bottom. Uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation and we'll have time for questions at the end. We're also recording this session and we'll be sharing the same with you afterward. So uh, as for myself, my name is Krishna Todi. As mentioned by Emily, I am a final year master's of um, public health student at Simon Fraser University and also the SIP representative from FSFU for the BCCI. Um, the BCCI is a dedicated platform for an innovative and localized model of the CCGHR. Uh, similar to early, earlier coalition institutes, BCCI's current theme is planetary health, global and local. So for those of you who are not familiar with the working group 
on the health impacts of climate change. It was in early 2018 to address the challenges at the intersection of health and climate change. The objectives are to identify the knowledge gaps through individual and institutional members to communicate the current state knowledge and awareness of drivers for and changes in climate related health. So one of our activities to help address this uh, is webinar series for which today's session is possible. So today we're presenting on climate change and health working with First Nations. So as highlighted in the recent IPCC reports, Indigenous peoples have a key role to play in helping to develop more sustainable governance models to uh, dealing with climate change in Canada. We often talk about vulnerabilities and risk assessments, but fail to acknowledge the structural and process related inequities imposed by our own surveys and other academic inquiries. Similarly, we fail to be re self -re reflective about our privileges as academic researchers and explicit about how we need to share power in our climate health research projects. So the goal for this presentation is to provide a more nuanced picture of climate health research than is usually discussed, emphasizing especially aspects that First Nations tend to pay more attention to. The webinar will also discuss climate change impacts on health and power asymmetries in climate health research, as well as highlight the potential leadership, the role of Indigenous peoples uh, in addressing climate health challenges. I'm particularly excited for this webinar as we have our amazing presenter today, Dr. Paivi Abernerthi. So Dr. Paivi is a climate change and health specialist with the First Nations Health Authority, research fellow at the University of Victoria and adjunct professor in the School of Environment, Resources and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo. She has been working in sustainable, healthy community development with indigenous and rural communities since 2005, focusing on social, ecological and indigenous determinants of health and community capacity building. Her work centers on impacts of various environmental factors on community and ecosystem health, ranging from climate change, pollution and natural resource governance to cultural and socioeconomic influences on health. So with this, I hand over to the, uh, the platform to our presenter, Dr. Paivi. Uh, Krishna, we may need a second here. Paivi just got uh, bounced out of the call for some reason. So oh. I'm just working with her right now to figure out why that is. Just hold okay. on. Okay, no problem. So we might just wait a couple of minutes here for our presenter. Can I ask a question while we wait? Um, so our presenter um, is having some technical issues and she got logged off this platform for some reason. So we're just waiting for her to figure out and come back on. She'll be on in probably a few moments. Um, and Blake, to answer your questions, yes, you're supposed to be seeing the slides, which will be shared by our presenter.
Perfect. So I think we have. Hello. Time. Sorry about that. Yeah. No problem. No problem. The platform is for you now. Okay. And I'm sorry. For some reason, the system kicked me suddenly out just when we started. So um, I hope somebody is still there and I didn't hear anything that you said. So thanks, <laughs> everyone, and welcome. So I'm actually one of the members of the CCGHR's Climate Change and Health Working Group. And um, I hope you are all well in this COVID madness and today's talk will not mention the virus again um, I actually mentioned that uh, only because I find our collective inability to think and operate in complex systems um, really little disturbing because we focus on one thing right now which is incredibly important but as all the other important things fall to the wayside. And I hope this talk stimulates and revitalizes uh, complex social ecological systems thinking in health research and generates a good foundation um, for future collaborative work and research with First Nations climate leaders and, and more strength focused research in general, because in health research, we tend to focus way too much in deficits and and challenges without looking uh, on assets and strings as much. So um, first I uh, wanted to wish you all a good day. I want to start by acknowledging that I live, work and play here in the unceded territories of Zauk Nation. And I actually want to express my gratitude to, for their warm welcome to me and our family. Um, about four years ago when we moved here to, uh, from Ontario. Um, and I'm not even trying to pronounce that since um, uh, I don't master the language here. So the first I want to start with the talking points. I want to share with some of the take home messages that I will be covering. Um, this is not your typical research um, talk for simple reason is that I want to also make a point. Um, I will talk about my own research just superficially. And the uh, objective for me here is to more to talk about alternative research problem framings and ways in which we could better work uh, more effectively and more meaningfully with First Nations uh, in climate health research context. And you are probably since this is a group of people already working in climate change, very familiar with some of the perspectives and science that I'm I'll be talking about. Uh, but I hope uh, that my multidisciplinary background will offer you some new food for thought um, in relation to climate research, climate health research and First Nations and information to those who don't know much and overview for those who, um, already work with these uh, issues. So first I want to situate myself um, because um, there are many approaches to climate health and um, I even talk about different approaches and aspects depending on which hat I happen to have on. I am, as you mentioned probably before, is that I'm adjunct professor in environmental studies. I am um, a research fellow at, at that was U Waterloo and 
I'm research fellow at some context and some context I'm the climate change and health specialist with FNHA. And um, when I talk about climate health, I talk about climate change impacts on health. So um, first I start about my context. Um, it's very vital for me to state, as which you probably hear from the accent, that I'm not indigenous here in North America and not representing or speaking on behalf of any First Nations peoples. Um, if in any context of anything that I'm representing, um, in some aspects sometimes I am representing the First Nations Health Authority and here today I'm actually representing myself primarily as a researcher. So um, I'm an academic and research practitioner specialized in public health and sustainability governance, particularly in children's environmental health and chronic disease prevention, climate health, and bringing together different ways of knowing for better policy and decision making. And I am also a Savonian, uh, which is uh, one of the two Eastern tribes. I'm North Savonian, actually, one of the East, two Eastern tribes in Finland. And I first arrived to Canada from actually Denmark just 20 years ago. So I'm also a new Canadian. But I have been working with First Nations since 2005. And I've actually worked with uh, nations from across the country, from Eskasoni, Mi'kmaq in uh, the east to here on the west coast, as e west as you can go, because I live here, uh, but also Northwest Territories uh, with Dene. And um, my focus is on any kind of research that and work that helps empower communities and by primarily helping them to uh, work with different ways of knowing. So um, that's all about me right now. There is a picture that sort of dates me. Uh, it's from our family summer camp uh, uh, or where my grandparents used to uh, spend all their summers way back when. So I start with an example that is not actually my own research, but just um, to illustrate the key piece here is that bringing together different ways of knowing um, to highlight the, one of the two critical aspects that are critical to my work, which is bringing those different ways of knowing together in a meaningful manner. And I, this paper is um, one of the better ones that I have seen that illustrates the value of bringing together indigenous and Western knowledge. And that two-eyed seeing is a concept coined by Eskasoni elders Mordena and Albert Marshall and Eskasonia are the Mi'kmaq on the, uh, in Nova Scotia. And then Dr. Cheryl Bartlett from Cape Breton University. And uh, it refers to learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledges and the ways of knowing, and learning to use both those eyes together to benefit all. And that's a term that is becoming more and more uh, common in academic research, but I also want to highlight the dangers in it. Um, for those of you who work, are interested or working with First Nations communities and haven't done that yet possibly, is that um, that is not a universal term. It's been adapted by the academics because it was first time um, connected uh, to the academic literature. But there are some communities even here on the West Coast are using it, but then there are others who have their own language. So for instance, um, and Skitchen, uh, who developed their own environmental impact assessment, that's two tribes uh, work living um, in what's called Kamloops and it, in those territories. It's their territories in Kamloops region. And uh, they used, uh, they developed the environmental impact assessment using indigenous appro uh, approaches to illustrate how um, that, to fight Ajax mine in their territories. And they used the term walking on two legs to illustrate how you need balance. So every community is different. And I will highlight that several times. So bear with me because they have different stories and different concepts. And so when you're working with communities, uh, 
or we, we should never assume anything. It's, it's more important to ask and listen. Uh, the more I learn and the more I know, the more I notice how little I know. So I usually just open up and uh, start from scratch every time I find I work with a new community. So Darlene, I just wanted to say that Darlene Anders Sanderson, who co-authored this with the Latin Nation and the scientists participating in this research, is a Cree professor from Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. And, and, um, and I wanted to highlight two particular points here. And one is that quantitative methods in Western science are often limited by their hypothesis, uh, meaning that um, they assume some things and are testing the hypothesis and, and assumptions. And, and that can be limiting um, in, uh, and missing critical aspects of complexity that is needed to deal with the real life situations, in particular in this kind of climate health uh, aspects. And that was came out from this research too. And uh, same time, I also want to highlight that when we think about traditional knowledge, like not all indigenous knowledge is traditional knowledge, and that's a whole different discussion itself. Elders who and knowledge keepers who are um, have carry tra traditional knowledge. They are um, sort of PhDs in their communities, and uh, and then there is the local knowledge, which is also incredibly valuable and important. But just also the terminology wise, is important to think. Um, what is uh, there and what what is the knowledge that we're collecting and how do we validate it and um, each knowledge system needs to be validated by their own merits so a good way for researchers to work in is to validate also the knowledge by making sure that community agrees what they found but the key piece in this research was that it, it really highlighted how some of the aspects would have been missed by the Western approach if the community hadn't been part of with the traditional and local knowledge in the research. So before I, uh, and before I jump into more into the climate health aspects, I want to highlight the two aspects of my theoretical framings. And this comes from being a multidisciplinary so empowerment is incredibly important and current approaches uh, of creating baseline, for instance, for climate action is very narrow and usually involves and focuses very much in vulnerabilities and risks. And even when we talk about adaptive capacity in these assessments, climate assessments, we talk it about adaptive capacity as it's something static. It's something that is and then nothing happens to it. Whereas um, the strength-based approaches that I uh, that I focus on and and where there's a very strong theoretical foundation, which you can study from Wallerstein's or Lavarack's backgrounds um, literature that I put in there, is that um, that creates ownership and uh, empowers communities uh, and it's really key piece in actually moving action forward and 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 critical element of healthy in building health and creating health and uh, i just to add here is that since this is mostly health researchers i'm not going to explain much more but it's the marmot study of english office workers that showed that that government office workers who had otherwise similar environments where they work the health health was very dependent on the their status in hierarchy and and that reflects that empowerment aspect that, that that if we feel that we have a power to change things then we tend to be healthier and there are studies that uh, most of you probably are familiar with the other thing that i really uh, focus on which comes from more from the environmental studies side health hasn't touched this too much is that there are huge power asymmetries even in research let alone in in all these community-based approaches and i just wanted to highlight here how our own language um, and the way we frame problems and the processes we choose to use as researchers 
are also based on that dominant Western scientific par paradigm and that unintentionally imposes power over indigenous ways of thinking. Even if you look at the examples that I put on the side, which, is, which are two supposedly empowering documents, the one is the BC Bill 41 uh, that ratified um, UNDRIP in BC. Uh, so it actually talks about the rights of indigenous people as an essential part of, of uh, uh, that law. And the other one is from residential school uh, support for financial support for resi residential school survivors. And even the program eligibility is formed in a way that um, is challenging and I have several friends who are highly educated um, so university professors, indigenous university professors who went to residential schools and didn't want to participate in this but where finally did it because of the pressure, social pressures and wanting to support their communities but that they found it very re-victimizing and dehumanizing and disempowering the whole process. And, and this is the thing that I want to highlight with these external examples of how as academics, we, our quantitative questionnaires can be very intimidating or, or depending on who is asking, um, like if we're not hiring community researchers to do the thing, then uh, even the process can be intimidating. Most indigenous people in Canada are bilingual culturally because they went through the school system. But, um, but if we want to respect the culture and demonstrate it in practice, it's, it's important to work in the early stages, even the way we've designed research. So um, thinking about how power operates through us and, and, and what we consider acceptable forms and expressions of knowledge is, is really critical in working with First Nations. And, and this is uh, my interest in research to study that. So I'm at the same time sharing this with you at the, uh, while I'm also focusing my research on this. And then we get to the real topic, <laughs> climate change and health. And uh, it's kind of, I always find awkward when it's not interactive, but let's start here is just to summarize, I'm not talking more about this. This is just to highlight the increased CO levels and, and uh, climate, uh, carbon dioxide is not the only uh, greenhouse gas, not even the worst one, as you know, but this is basically just providing the high overview uh, on, on the different, the pathways that the way I think and the ideas that are important, acute health threats and long-term health threats are the two that I separate, which is very seldom separated in our literature academic literature for the time being. We, we talk a lot about things in a nice mishmash and compare apples and oranges and don't think about the pathways. And here is uh, an example about the pathways as told by BC government. I, I actually really like this picture in the terms that it simply highlights, makes us, forces us to think about the natural and built environments and the community and social factors and livelihood factors. And then at the bottom there is the lifestyle factors where I throw just that, I want to highlight the health inequities that we have um, because um, the structural unfairness and, and all the residential school his, and racism and resource extraction, cultural genocide, all that that has traumatized the communities that we are working with when we do and conducting research with them and for them. And uh, that's a uh, quite key piece to, to keep in mind. But in general, I want to focus in this particular brief talk only on those health impacts, climate health impacts that are rather unique for First Nations and the short term impacts I wanted to highlight this, this uh, coastal issues there are many others, but uh, basically in here in BC, somewhere one third, 30 to 50% of uh, indigenous communities are actually <clears throat> out uh, coastal. There are over 200 communities and 
and they're almost 100, I think it's about 80, <clears throat> 85, somewhere there, a communities that consider themselves coastal. <clears throat> and, um, and these communities are nowadays having significant uh, problems with these algae blooms, toxins, and bacterial infections. There was a cholera outbreak um, in herring eggs. And, and this is an example, we're having a paper coming out of the, of the response to that and how you engage indigenous communities uh, in a meaningful manner from the get-go. But uh, the illustrating the climate change problem here is that, um, so cholera bacteria uh, is associated with warming waters in coastal warming waters. And the uh, herring egg is, uh, is a, one of the key one very important uh, component in traditional foods here, and uh, it's in many communities eaten raw. So the public health measures that saying, okay, so boil your uh, eggs is is not really effective, and it doesn't make any sense for communities. So there are these kind of cultural challenges uh, in addressing climate change and health. There are also issues with the monitoring because a lot of the all the monitoring with the fisheries and oceans um, department DFO is happening most they focus on the commercial fisheries so so there are very little of uh, um, information available for communities but I'll talk more about that later so the other aspect of looking at the climate change and health that we also don't discuss very much um, is the long term the land and water cycles and the food system and uh, that really impacts First Nations here because a lot of the communities are uh, rural. And we all learned, or those of us who learned at school, um, that uh, forest fires are a good thing. Uh, and now we are discovering that the forests are actually not growing back very well here. Um, and this here is, again, the part of the essence that I'm trying to highlight is that there is a lot of traditional knowledge in First Nations communities, and now I focus on the BC, uh, but um, it's the aspect that uh, um, traditionally First Nations here actually practice controlled burning to avoid big fires. And there are studies both in um, in here in the interior and then in the Washington and Oregon so scholarly papers about the effects, uh, how that actually reduces climate change. And that falls outside of a traditional a conventional health research, but at the same time bring for First Nations that is not separated. So when we're doing health research and looking at the health impacts, it's, it's looking at the whole and thinking of empowering communities to think about the how can they address actively the or proactively ensure that there aren't fewer forest fires and hence the health impacts are not there the negative health impacts that come with the forest fires and there are multiple multitudes of issues with the with various food sources that impact uh, also the First Nations. And uh, I'll talk more about that later. I wanted to highlight here that um, climate change doesn't happen in vacuum. So the systems thinking of thinking of there is the, for the First Nations health, and I talk a little bit more probably should have had that first but is is when we think about salmon is a good i use salmon here as an example is that uh it's it's a keys keystone species very important traditionally for most coastal nations in one way or the other and depending on what species it happens to be but there is its impact climate change impacts its spawning and and harvest seasons the fish come at different times the temperatures are uh too high, the water may be too high temperature for the reproduction. There is less fresh water, so they can't come up the rivers. The ocean levels, oceans are more acidified or at, as well as the fresh water because of there is more carbon dioxide in the water and the water more than ever. 
And so the, as there's some acidification taking place in particular with more shallower waters. And, and that impacts the reproduction of the salmon and salmon is so essential for the cultural identity. So that starts impacting both mental, spiritual health and, and there are the toxic blooms that I talked about and various contaminant releases that impact because the warmer temperatures release uh, chemicals. They change the balance of um, equilibrium in between sediment and the water. So these are all indirect impacts and long-term impacts that have, can have severe impacts on indigenous health. And if we as health researchers don't look at the whole and, and think about that, um, I think, uh, we are not getting anywhere. And this, I assume that all you can read this, but it is basically is that worldview aspect that I wanted to highlight uh, as a key piece here in trying to understand how First Nations have historically had a very different approach to their environment. Their, most languages don't even have such an terms as nature and environment because the culture cultures um, see themselves so centrally as part of the environment and as part of the land and the water. So when we're talking about Western environment, it's better term is lands and waters, but it's also the innate stewardship sense of rights and responsibilities to to the all our relations that we are connected to. And as a biochemist, I think that that for me, we are uh, from Western science perspective, we are mammals amongst mammals. So so we are not separated. We are DNA coded beings that are really dependent in the same way on one another, other species, be it plants or water and air. And, and I just had this here just to illustrate that difference in, in our contemporary uh, Western scientific paradigm that very often puts the man on the top and uh, then that relational more um, relational worldview of the ecocentric perspectives. When I want to introduce you to this concept, um, this is a tool, if anybody is ever interested in also published both scientifically and EPA's websites, the tools how to work with and can be adapted to use and can be that will help uh, work with the health concepts from different worldviews. Um, if you, if you go to an in, a First Nations community and, and ask what makes them healthy, it's not necessarily, um, um, let's say, uh, they, they don't talk about the BMI or, 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 or a glass of, how many glasses of wine they can drink or what impacts health. And uh, this was developed by Jamie Donatuto, uh, who is a toxicologist, uh, not, she got a, PhD in U, at UBC, but uh, she's American, the Swinomish nation where this is developed is south of the border. And she worked with an elder, Larry Campbell, and they've been working on this for about 20 years now. And it started by them, re by Jamie de realizing that the toxicological measures that she was looking at health, they didn't make any sense to the community. And even her findings didn't really mean much. So, this just highlights that uh, there's a participatory approach to this and and the, and, and Swinomish nations identified community connections, self-determination and balance education, natural resource security and cultural practices as their key indicators for their health. But this is different from community to community and that's the, the other take home message that I want to highlight is that Every community is different, and this is just a tool to work with them. And this is something that I am learning to work with in my research and work at the, with the First Nations Health Authority. Um, food is very central. The traditional food is very central for the climate health discussions in First Nations. Um, anytime there is... Um, 
it's almost any time there is any community, it comes up in one way or the other. And it's central to recognize, because these are things that I didn't know, and I used to work as a community health promoter in, um, in Northern Ontario with First Nations communities and about food systems, is that um, I knew that the traditional food is superior natural, nutrition, nutritional quality and Larry, Larry Chan's um, the First Nations food environment and contaminants, contaminants study demonstrated that nicely. There are quite a number of publications. I put one there. But what I didn't realize until I started working on specific projects here in BC is that most First Nations um, people eat traditional food and it is much more than nutrition, even though it's most, most nutritious. It's soul food, it's part of identity, it's part of social collect connections. It's, it's sharing food is, is really um, uh, essential part of the culture. And yet at the same time, all these resource extraction and climate change uh, cumulative impacts are threatening that. And this is now BC, uh, there are studies across the country, but because I focus on BC is that there is, um, it's disturbing that there is food insecurity in almost half of the families and 25% and of households with children are having uh, food security issues. So losing um, even more uh, access to traditional foods uh, because of climate change is, can, is very detrimental. And it's these kind of studies that really are probably needed to how to counteract that type of things. Um, from the health perspective, this is just a quick overview. I already said some of these things is that um, uh, there is lack of access and that leads to obesity and chronic diseases because people eat much less nutritious white bread processed foods. Um, climate change also leads to different ways to contaminated foods and medicines and that's a um, different talk. I can't put everything in half an hour. But there are they but I mentioned the infectious diseases from cholera like the cholera eggs, acute toxicity from the toxins in algal booms chronic diseases and developmental origin of health and disease. So um, different exposures from chemicals, for instance, or um, that, that are released because of climate change. There is a further loss of identity and cultural social fabric and spiritual aspects and, and socioeconomic impact pathways because a lot of people are dependent on the sources of their hunting, fishing, and and other and and forestry, community forestry. So these are things that we know. And when I'm talking about asset based, it's important to recognize the problems and maybe document them. But at the same time, we it's. I think for us as health, climate health researchers, it's critical also to empower people. And I sound very advocacy oriented here, but I think if you work with climate health, that's what you sort of become. And this is something that um, I have been instructed by my indigenous colleagues not to ever forget. So I am sharing this with you because uh, rights-based approaches we often forget. Um, Aboriginal rights were originally defined in the Royal Proclamation in 1763 and the Abro uh, then Aboriginal title has been recognized in common law in Canada since 1888. And I want to highlight this because this is something that the non-Indigenous researchers often completely miss. And this is something Indigenous uh, peoples in on this land actually expect you to know about. So the Royal Proclamation stated, any lands that had not been ceded to or purchased by us as aforesaid are reserved to the said Indians. It also recognizes that the Aboriginal lands are reserved to them or any of them as their hunting grounds which in a sense defines Aboriginal right as the right of the First Nations to harvest resources from their traditional territories. And 
so this has been sort of modified or added to and 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 there's other three concepts that I think that you need to know is the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People because it's um, it really highlights um, it establishes the universal framework of minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of the indigenous peoples, which is based on human rights standards. And it emphasizes the rights of indigenous people to make peoples to maintain and strengthen their own institutions, cultures, and tradition, and to pursue their development in keeping with their own needs and aspirations. And and this is BC doesn't have, BC is completely unceded territory in the terms of there are almost no treaties, but this is also valid for the treaty nations across the country, because that's what the treaties are about. That's what was negotiated. And Bill 41 is the first, so we have, we have acknowledged the UNDRIP in Canada, but we haven't ratified it yet. There is the talks and there's a lot of confusion about it, but BC was the first uh, province that actually ratified it last December. And then the third piece that I don't know how many of you are aware is that the section 35 is really key. And that's the Constitution Act from 1982, which states it has multiple steps, but the first uh, segment is the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. So. When you are work, working with indigenous communities in Canada, they are, as said, and see themselves as nations. And so we are not dealing with municipalities or, or, or communities the same way, even though they're operationalized partially the same way because it's smaller communities. But I think that's a key piece, even in health research, to realize the rights-based approach that, that in climate health research. And there are changes. I'm looking at the time, so I'm trying to go a little faster because I started late. Um, but the, there is a change in the air because IPCC reports have heavily focused on indigenous peoples lately. The one in June 2009 highlighted the findings that show that lands governed by indigenous peoples are significantly healthier and less damaged than those managed by non-indigenous people. And in September, they actually explicitly stated that um, that maybe we should learn, uh, maybe the values, not even maybe the values of the indigenous people are probably quite critical and central in addressing climate change uh, in contemporary context. So um, then I move on to the community driven research that I focus on and uh, that I think is very strongly recommended and desired by communities. But before that, I want to just cap here is that stewardship is central. Um, I haven't yet met an indigenous community that doesn't focus on collective good uh, and intergenerational responsibility and having the relationship with um, the land and the waters and the air and other beings um, and focus on seven generations but that said that every single community is different and and they really there are really significant cultural differences and having worked uh, extensively in northern Ontario and then here it's like take differences between Finland and Italy or Russia and England. So it's, and even within just uh, here in BC, even within hundred kilometers, the communities can be very different and language is very different. But the essence of, of the aspects that I'm trying to highlight here, maybe uh, for the research perspectives is that when we look at the health impacts and recognizing the health impacts and many monitoring them, it's, it's really central to focus on the strengths in the communities and demonstrate and study also the leadership that the First Nations are showing. And I mentioned the Suinamis Climate Change Initiative and, and the, in the health indicators they have developed, but I also, in, in, in Canada, 
um, the guardians, they don't talk much about health, but what they work with is health and climate change in the reality. So it's, it's just to illustrate that there is a lot of different types of leadership, not just in BC, but all across Canada. It just doesn't get studied or worked on. And I think there's a great potential in health researchers to start actually working with that. And here are the key pieces that First, First Nations community work has taught me is that there needs to be strength-based comprehensive approaches that invite all the people to the table. This is um, Tunaha community that did their comprehensive community planning, which is funded by the federal government here in BC, particularly, I don't know about outside. It's a specific, specific toolkits and, and many communities don't have uh, resources to do that, but to, to do them alone. But that's where I personally see that us researchers can play a huge role in working with communities and bringing the health lens uh, to these conversations more explicitly. It is when the communities are working, it always comes up, but these are the things that we can learn from too, and at the same time, uh, support communities in, in, in reconciliation and, and building their own strengths. Here's the other aspect that I have found very interesting is I talked about the, the, um, controlled burning. There are many others, but clam gardens is one that actually is an example that many communities here are now starting to look at as an alternative food source because food is key piece on in health and um, and um, climate change adaptation. Uh, clams, for whatever reason, seem to be most stable and resilient in terms of acidification and warmer temperatures for the time being. And clam gardens was actually one form of agriculture here on this side of the coast. I don't know if it was also on the other side. Because um, First Nations here in, in, on the West Coast, that this was the hub uh, where there was a lot of strong business going on and trade networks and uh, like from the Kamloops area, there were copper plates that have been found up in Alaska and down in New um, Mexico, but clam gardens, uh, Haida, there was some archeological study that demonstrated in Haida, they had been doing it at least for 3000 years. And now it's something that we revitalizing because the fish, fish um, stocks are collapsing. And, uh, and, uh, Other food sources, traditional food sources are really disappearing. And there is also the stewardship aspect that people don't want to eat something that is sparse because there is that's so fundamentally ingrained in the thinking that you do not deplete your relatives and resource and and kill your neighbors. <laughs> um this project that I want, this is actually one um type of research that I'm working with, but I'm skipping this more, but this is an example of how communities choose to work with uh, climate change, climate health adaptation when they are given money and, 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 and they can choose their own direction. And this is one in the Northern British Columbia that involves uh, school and the Bandaud Environmental Consulting Agency, Council Health and Lands Departments, elders and scientists, it's, classroom teaching and land-based learning about the traditional harvesting and community gardening and um, GIS mapping and strategy development. This is what communities do when they do their research and no, no researchers interfere. So there's a huge potential of working with, this is a strong community, there are not so many communities that are as strong. There's a ton of leadership that I could tell more about but I can see we're running out of time because I started late. Um, these are communities that I've worked with, um, not Chauk Nation, but uh, Henry Inlet and uh, a little bit with Kanaka Bar. And uh, so um, these are visionary people. And, and we are also, I'm leading a project in Health Adapt uh, about developing community-driven monitoring systems uh, 
which I mentioned previously that they are there they have there's a huge concern of identifying what food is safe and what is not and uh, developing systems and mechanisms um, we had we have health Canada funding of two from two different sources for this and this it, it also includes implementation phase so that uh, includes teaching for kids so that it doesn't disappear in the first uh, when somebody leaves a job so we train in communities at the from kids up another aspect of health is co-governance and the empowerment and I and and I'm working with coach and what is it pro to see if they have needs uh, to do some research uh, on health aspects and um, that's one of the good examples of um, of uh, indigenous and non-indigenous people working actually in full collaboration uh, so that there is half and half of the board is indigenous and the other half is non-indigenous and uh, and that has and and they are focusing on health of both the people and the environment and uh, more to be heard later on and my other emphasis here is this thinking about um, system thinking is that also recognizing the knowledge and and the rights has been demonstrated by other scholars that is central to improvement of health among indigenous peoples and i'm sorry this got so quickly end here if you have any questions now is the time and i hope we have a couple of minutes to answer <laughs> i can send you emails if you have questions all right so thank you so much pivy for the wonderful and super informative presentation so now we can open up the session to questions and discussions so just a reminder you can type your questions in the chat box you just have to click the chat button at the bottom um, and make sure that you're sending to everyone. You could also send the question just to myself so I can see them, or you can just unmute yourself and we'll be able to hear your audio. Um, so just because we started late, the webinar is now pushed a little bit um, more, 15 minutes. So we're gonna end at 2.45 instead. We apologize for the inconvenience. So yeah, the platform is now open to questions. I figured nobody dared to ask anything. <laughs> Maybe this is so different for the um, for the conventional research. Absolutely. If someone wants to talk their question out, you are free to do so. All right, so Paige, we've got two questions already. Uh, first is from Anna. She wants to know if you can elaborate a little bit on the cholera outbreak um, and also a bit of your experience working with indigenous communities. Um, the cholera outbreak, I was not part of that. I am just uh, the one who did the assessment and evaluation afterwards. So cholera outbreak was, uh, uh, it was discussed discovered that there were some there is some individuals getting sick and then you do the so the this is actually a huge question in the terms of also explaining how the whole uh, health system works in in BC let's put it that way I'll summarize it very quickly in the terms of the so BC has a unique situation in that there are provincial health authorities, five regions. And then there is a First Nations Health Authority, which is unique combination because normally uh, indigenous health historically is funded by a uh, federal government and uh, each community needs or, or tribal council, whichever way people have organized themselves, uh, had, has to apply for every single program separately in public health programs and, and like, um, um, and uh, in, in child development and a lot of other things. 
separately from the first uh, from the federal government and uh, in First Nations here, the 200 almost of them got together and and decided that they established First Nations Health Authority that was established 2013, which takes some of those responsibilities and applies funding and works together it's, um, with the uh, regional authorities, health authorities, which is a completely different system than from other provinces for that matter. But so, so we didn't, so this whole outbreak was that it was identified that there were people who were getting sick and it was discovered that it was possibly from the herring eggs. And then it was discovered that it was cholera, but it, it took a little while before it was dis identified which strain, but that if it's the cholera that really kills people, or if it's a strain um, that is just causing mild diarrhea and, and, and discomfort. And so um, in that process, to find out, to do the detective work, uh, to find out where the sources were, who the people were, and, and, um, and how it could be best addressed, and how people should be informed, and what should be closed, should fisheries be closed, and so on and so forth. That is the public health response system that actually is in place, and then how to adapt that to, how to make sure that communities have that information. So that, uh, that in itself is a paper that is coming out. So I refer to that paper, but uh, that was that, um, it turns out, it turned out not to be the cholera that um, is the most dangerous kind, but it, this, that, this experience demonstrated how the FNHA's close trust relationship with the First Nations really speeded up the process and helped to develop uh, effective uh, correspond, I mean, interaction and collaboration. For instance, the First Nations that were most affected, they were loaning their boats to go and, and collect samples and showed where they were harvesting and told about their ways of processing food and stuff like that. And that's a key piece that is goes missing if you don't work with the communities and you don't have the trust relationship. So that was a long answer about that. Uh, my experience working with communities is, um, comes from everything from living in Northern Ontario, which, uh, which is, means you're working and living with First Nations, uh, in my case. Uh, so my experience comes from lived experience, outside of work too. Um, and then I have worked as an environmental consultant uh, with Indigenous people. I have worked as an Aboriginal health promotion specialist across Ontario for Cancer Care Ontario. Um, as a community learning series, learning series, so that was more provincial level superficial. And then currently I am back to being provincial, uh, working across BC with all 200 nations. So it's limited in that case now what I'm working daily with communities, but I have both the daily and the provincial level experience. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pavi. So our next question is from Jocelyn Radcliffe. She wants to know um, how do you recommend researchers initiate relationships or just work within the communities? Um, and are there any network that you can recommend that she can liaise with or we can link up with? So where was she from? Um, she's not mentioned. Okay. So there are different ways of depending on what type of, what level uh, of uh, work you're looking at and research, First Nations operate and see a very context specific. So local and sub-regional is a good way of working with communities, but of course you need all levels. So um, depending on the level, um, there are, there's a regional way of working and, and then also, there are provincial organizations and national organizations. So if you're interested in national level organizations, that's AFN, and, and they work in a lot of um, research projects. Um, there are regional level. It would be actually easier if you sent me an email, and then I can guide in the area that you are in, 
uh, the, the province because it depends a lot on the province and the topic of health. And um, one good way is just contacting communities of interest or actually, yeah, it's now I'm ram rambling and ranting. <laughs> Those communities are also very tired of people just coming in. So uh, you oftentimes want to build a relationship without um, the problem first and, and do something. So I think it's a much more complex than that, but I'm more than happy to have a discussion to explore one person's situation and, uh, and guide in that aspect. And First Nations organizations are, mm -hmm. there are tons of them. Uh, we just did the screening study on the health related organizations within certain areas here in BC. And uh, there are disabilities or people working with uh, in indigenous disabilities. So finding an organization by Googling and reaching out is probably easiest when you're not familiar and then they can lead you either to the communities other way is health directors in BC, indigenous health directors of their own organization. So Google is an amazing place to start finding things. Perfect. So Jocelyn, our recommendation would be to just privately connect with Ivy to have a more uh, deepened insight on that. Um, I got a question from Arnold as well, privately. Um, he wants to know if you can give any idea on the life expectancy trends of First Nations people and if there are any positive health impacts from conventional medicine for First Nations. I, th I, so life expectancy wise there, okay, so I wouldn't even possibly answer in this in a, in a appropriate manner, but I want to highlight is that their life, ex so overall in the big picture, when we're looking at super last statistics across Canada, we know that First Nations have a lower life expectancy up to seven years, I think but I don't cite me on that one because there are super statistics on that on Statistics Canada and elsewhere. Um, but the, my emphasis here would be that, for instance, in BC, there are stronger and weaker communities. And that doesn't, oftentimes the bigger ones are nowadays much stronger because uh, they have the power in numbers. Cause, but um, I think my message here is really, um, that what really works with and helps First Nations communities is that local context to work with uh, them and to actually work with them to find out um, what um, matters to them in the terms of there are national, they're not necessarily good, but they are getting better, um, national statistics. Um, there used to be a resistance uh, in First Nations communities to actually respond to Stats Canada inquiries, but uh, that because of a situation and our internal national culture has changed, uh, it, it, the statistics tend to, the recent statistics are more reliable and they are available um, the generic uh, are available online uh, in any university library, but uh, at the same time, the community specific would be very hard to find. Uh, so that's something that of course people need to work themselves on. And sorry, I didn't say about the high level, but I think the point is that we know that the statistics are bad in diabetes too. We know that, that all these classical heart diseases um, poverty rates, all those aspects are not so good. And that has something to do with our wonderful colonial legacy. So, um. Thank you so much, Pivey. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Our se uh, next question is from Solal. He wants, he's wondering if, um, what the power dynamic looks like between the indigenous leaders and the government as it relates to governance? That's also a question, a whole 
presentation mm -hmm. itself. So indigenous leadership is also interesting in Canada because you have traditional leaders and then you have Indian Act leaders. Indian Act uh, is the determines is is the the way um, we we and uh, and and our government sort of in historically controlled um, people and put them in reserves, and and that in modern context Indian um, Act dictates or determines not dictates determines that. Um, every two years there has to be an election. And so there are elected chiefs and then there are traditional hereditary chiefs. And that is not necessarily, and most often not the same case. And the difference uh, between, and what we saw, saw in, uh, here in BC not so long ago is the biggest difference is that, uh, so the reserves where people live are those again, determined by Indian Act where they previously were not even allowed to leave uh, without the permission from the Indian agent, they couldn't go to see their kids. They couldn't go and sell their eggs or cows or chickens or harvest. And um, and these are these documents can also, by the way, find be found on online. But those are the small postage stamp sites areas where we call the reserves where the indigenous communities formerly live. But the traditional territories were much larger and, and, and the traditional heritage chiefs um, govern those uh, also, uh, and, and, um, and in healthy communities, they work together and, and because of all the trauma, sometimes there are disagreements. And then how, so that in itself creates sometimes tension that was created by Indian Act and government. And then the government not, uh, recognizing the nation to nation and and the equal foot uh, negotiation power. That's where the power dynamics place to comes to play is that uh, we still have a very colonial approach to telling uh, First Nations what to do and what they can do. And when we like their opinions or when we don't like their opinions, um, and I'm saying we, because in this case, I take a part of responsibility being a newcomer and settler, even though, I, I'm the first one in my family ever uh, emigrating. Um, so um, this, I hope that answered a little. So there are significant power tensions in way of language, process, attitudes, legal aspects, and so on and so forth. Uh, first Nations in Canada had, in most cases, more democratic and consensus based, relatively good uh, systems uh, in place before. Um, we sort of came and messed it up. Perfect, thank you so much, Paivi. So um, we just have one question left, if you could just answer it very briefly, um, and then we can wrap up. So this is from Mira. Um, she says that she appreciates that there is more conversation around respecting wildlife in policy that acknowledges and even integrates First Nations perspective. But in your experience, do indigenous perspectives value life, wildlife just for the sake of a fellow life form? or do conversations revolve mostly around wildlife as resource for human benefit? That's a huge question. Yes. Uh, I don't speak in behalf of First Nations people and, and every culture is different, but the fundamental is that, so First Nations traditionally don't talk about resources, they talk about all our relations. And in that, the whole conversation about ecosystem services is offensive to that relations discussions, but there are First Nations communities who have chosen uh, to buy pipelines because that's the way they choose to be um, in power, better be in the game than totally outside of the game. The same way people, the communities are very, very different, but in general, there is that stewardship relations. All of our relations repairs to uh, the earth and the, so the land and the waters, you take care of them, they take care of you, you see things as relations. I think that's as anything that I can say, because I don't think I should be going and, and telling 
my perceptions of how things are because that's also what I think it's very dangerous and and me speaking on behalf of First Nations I'm only speaking on behalf of me as a non North American indigenous person um, in um, in the way I see as a researcher how we can work together and 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 the things that I've learned to through my own mistakes and and understanding from based on my own cultural backgrounds that are somewhat similar in some aspects but not at all in some others mm -hmm. so that was a very long answer again so <laughs> i think there's a fundamental worldview difference the stewardship principle and mm -hmm. and and that reflects the relationship to animals awesome uh thank you so much Pivy. so um i would like to wrap up now um and not taking people any more time of people um so i'd like to thank again dr Pivy, for giving us an amazing set of information and to everyone for attending today's session apologies for it going on and extending for more than we anticipated um i hope we could go further with the discussion too at another time um, I'm sorry if anyone ran into any technical difficulties during the session. We'll make sure to follow up with all the registrants with the recording, as well as further information to just keep these discussions going on. Um, I wish all of you a good rest of the week and take care, stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you.